Welcome to the RCM Ladder. We dive into career development and growth for revenue cycle professionals, helping you level up your career one episode at a time. This episode of the RCM Ladder is brought to you by our good friends at the Health Exchange. They are building an awesome community of revenue cycle professionals with the knowledge, insights, and resources needed to navigate the ever-changing landscape of healthcare reimbursement. The team at the Health Exchange have awesome content and events tackling everything from denials management to revenue integrity, patient access, and the importance of leveraging RPA or AI in your operations. The content is so useful, so smart, so impressive, so collaborative, honestly, it makes us jealous. So go check them out now, right now, and then come back to us. You can find them at healthexchange.io, that's H-E-A-L-T-H-X-C-H-A-N-G-E dot I-O. And now on to this week's discussion. Hey, what's up everyone? James Sorbers here, as always, your host of the RCM Ladder. This week, my guest, the one, the only, Ken Hogue, Chief Revenue Cycle Officer of uh, United Health Services in Binghamton, New York. Ken, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Ken, I wanted to start, first of all, I want to congratulate you. You've been recently promoted to, to Chief Revenue Cycle Officer. So congratulations on that pr promotion. I'm very curious, you know, that's sort of a new title you're starting to I'm starting to see it more and more, the revenue cycle being elevated into the C-suite. And, you know, I'd love to hear for you this sort of promotion, having that C-suite title. What does that mean for you, you know, both personally and professionally? Well, personally for me, I think it's an honor. And honestly, I've always said that I wanted to be at the VP level, at least, or chief revenue cycle officer by the time I'm 40. That's been a goal of mine probably since I've been like 15 or 20 years old. I knew that there needed to be some innovation in this space early on. Um, as working in my grandfather's office as a doctor was one of the first jobs that I had. And I saw kind of the disparity between clinical and financial and administration. And there really needed to be like a key mediator or touch point. So to me, that's what the chief revenue cycle officer is. So personally, it's very near and dear to my heart. But then also on a career level, it's a true honor and distinction that shows that to me, for a larger health system, hospital groups that have more than, you know, one hospital and larger physician practices that are hospital owned, it really shows the innovation and the collaboration and the key phrase of what a true ecosystem is. Because each, you know, geographic uh, location can have differences. And really, the chief revenue cycle officer takes from a traditional model, I think, of just revenue cycle incorporating, you know, the financials and best practices. But really, then is what's the innovation part to keep us current with technology to also be that like brand ambassador for the organization and the true decision maker at a system level in order to like make sure that, as you said, that voice is at that table, right? Because revenue cycle can see things through finances and appeals and processes that also may align with clinical and it's a true partnership. So to me, the chief revenue cycle title is newer coming around and in some organizations it's that the full c-suite others you have a spot at that table or those planning and budget groups so each organization's different but it's really to speak up for growing the footprint risk and also keeping things balanced but then really the true people person that can help balance and mediate those tough conversations between clinical financial and even HR when it comes to large organizations and having to balance staff and technology on a daily basis. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, so there's a lot to get into to that. But I wanted to start in your early teen. You knew that this is what you wanted to do. You said, was it your grandfather's practice? Your yes. father's practice? 
my grandfather. So military is a huge part of my family as yeah. everyone seemed to. My dad's 35 years retired military veteran. Yeah. Um, my mom's father, cardiology. And then when you look at it, it was really about, you know, early on, I was like, well, HMOs are happening. Health systems are happening. It's not paper records. Even at five years old, my parents were always like, you very much like buttons and technology and like, you know, taking things apart. I think, you know, being German and French for a background, it's very much that type of engineering, like from European culture. But then too, it was, how do you talk and communicate? I really didn't like being around kids my own age. I more wanted to be at the five, six year old or seven you know, the briefcase with your initials or the backpack and then having the adult conversations with my grandparents and really their business and also like involved with lawyers and other things like that they had as running a business. I wanted to be like, can I go to this? Can I just like sit and be quiet and like observe, but then ask questions? And, you know, then I started as far as like taking notes. And then literally, I think, you know, at the 12 to 15 year old like Mark, that's where technology I knew was a part of the future. I had an opportunity given to me that by my father being in the military, I probably wouldn't have had otherwise where we moved from Charleston, South Carolina to Washington State. I went to Clahalia, which is a school that Bill Gates and that community mm -hmm. from Microsoft developed. And at the age of like 13 and 14, we were using laptop and Blackboard to submit our schoolwork with escalators and elevators in the school to where technology was taught early on. And then that to me just made it decide I didn't want to be a computer programmer. I always liked healthcare. I didn't want to be a surgeon with guts and, you know, like blood and all of those types of things. But that's kind of where I was like, they need to be able to provide the health care that the patients need, but need to really have somebody to take all the semantics and the idiosyncrasies and break those down. So that way they know where to focus. They know how to escalate for things that are issues and then also to continue to allow things to be efficient. Right. Because, I mean, like we've all had a healthcare experience where you're like, my God, this is so slow or what's happened, like I can't get in, or, you know, a bad patient experience with a family member. And when we're advocates and in healthcare, we're very judgmental of that, right? So early on, that's kind of when, you know, with my grandparents' practice, they very much saw the community is what makes them successful, right? True people, persons, and really like giving back to the community and remembering where they came from. Many of my family members use the GI Bill to put themselves through college or education to go within professional careers. So that to me is where healthcare and I think veterans has been instilled upon me probably since the time I was born. Um, so, you know, I'm curious for you because probably not everyone who works at Revenue Cycle knew from a young age that or could you kind of see where they were going, right? I think a lot of it. For you, I mean, has your role changed substantially since sort of being elevated to, to the chief revenue cycle officer? Or what sort of that been like for you in that transition? Like what is now expected of you that maybe wasn't Well, before? I think we're still in the transition period. I would say that I was already doing probably 60 to 70% of it before. Because I was always that, you know, director, senior director, executive director level, or, you know, worked in a consulting role similar to a VP level to where I knew that I was always one of the strongest people at the table, right? Like I had to learn that I needed to be quiet more and allow others to talk because like I could see things and literally I see patterns and numbers or like I can, you know, hear it once, type it once, see it once and have it. Other people don't learn that fast. So for me, that's where, you know, this elevation part of the level now allows me to mentor those on my team to make sure that they have like the right tools across the entire system. So healthcare has really evolved post-COVID 
prior to COVID, I mean, things changed, but so many things were put on hold for the pandemic that I would feel like 2024 is the land of ever changing and even faster than it was like during COVID. Like you had to figure out COVID care and telemedicine and all of that other stuff like early on, but now all of those regulations or things that were put on pause, we're seeing it come fast and furious. So that's kind of where it's dividing and conquering, but also with a strategic prioritization. So now that I have all of that information or those key leaders reporting to me, we're able to work within a refined process or that ecosystem that yes, we have a lot of work. Yes, people sometimes feel overwhelmed, but it's how do you remove that full stress that really is just more of a pressure that's a deterrence from actually receiving results. And that's kind of where, you know, now with this change, you know, at the system level and talking with the departments and talking with the clinical leaders and the executive leaders of the organization, we're getting them excited about revenue cycle. And they understand that without revenue cycle and healthcare delivery, you can have the best clinical team possible. You can have the best like outcomes, but if your organization's not collecting money or the patient experience within their revenue cycle, scheduling functions, billing, charity care, and helping them with hardship is not done within a patient-centric, more concierge type of approach, people have choices. And that's where you see how systems either losing market share or you see others that have that earned trust that I think, you know, as the chief revenue cycle officer, it's how do I balance that? I have the financial and the revenue cycle piece. Now I need to work on making sure the community's perception of revenue cycle is understood and also educating the patient because more and more is owed out of pocket. There are more challenges or adjudication type of appeals. And if you don't work within this business, it's very scary for patients, right? Especially elderly patients. They feel lost within the system. They feel that, you know, you got to talk to seven different people. So that's really where I'm focused on creating the ecosystem within the community, define partnership between our patient population, patient experience and financials, and really to bringing technology and care to folks and patients and teaching them so we can embrace in order to get them the care when they need it as soon as possible and faster and help them understand and feel comfortable with that because change is not easy for a lot of people. Yeah, that, that's incredible. You said a lot in that I want to unpack, you know, the importance of being able to listen in meetings. But something you said that was really kind of interesting was sort of getting the rest of the organization excited about revenue cycle which yep. I hear kind of time and time again from other people, other guests. And this is maybe not an elegant way to put it, but there is sort of this feeling of like revenue cycle professional. Like when you're in it, you know the value you bring to the organization. But the perception of being like a second class citizen in terms of and the importance on the clinical side, and, and we're not going to like downplay, that is very important. Yeah. But the feeling that like people don't value the contributions that you bring to the organization, even within the organization themselves. And that seems to be like a very hard thing for people working within revenue cycle. I hear that a lot. We really fostered to understand to the organization of what level of talent and the complexity of the work in order to meet the KPIs and objectives of the organization as well as some of the chief complaints from the clinical side of the administrative burdens. And that's where I think, you know, as I said, I was kind of doing some of that chief revenue cycle officer work early on. We heard, you know, from authorizations or offices or clinical reviews that they were very frustrated and they're like, it's listed, but we're still getting denied and it's tying up dollars. So we really had to focus on putting a collaborative group together and really leveraging for what is the 
controllable versus non-controllable and then educate folks on those key like top five revenue cycle metrics. And then we helped partner with them in the things that they were struggling with because we were like, clinically, what you have is fine. It just may need to be notated in a different format or a little bit more enriched. So where do we use technology? And this will also make your job easier. Here at UHS, we utilize Epic. So like a lot of technology and the providers, but sometimes it's showing them what they're struggling with. If they embrace some of the technology and they may use some of those workflows, it may actually make their day shorter and easier to where they're able to see more patients and not have to enter information multiple times. And that's really where we've changed the culture. Because before many people, it's the finger pointing revenue cycle messed this up. Access care staff should have got this. You know, when you really show them the information was correct, but insurance companies, systems, or payer technology may not be timed correctly. Like there's a timing variance. They're like, wait a minute. So we did everything right, but we still got denied. Like, how is that possible? And then why am I being penalized with some of their metrics or qualifying scores with value based? So that's really over the last year and a half as I met with the departments and key people of the organization, when I kept hearing of those pain points, I was like, how do I campaign for revenue cycle and get the organization to be like, it's a partnership and let me help them with the things that they're struggling with. I mean, it's so important. It's like getting people excited about the value that marketing brings, being able to communicate and get buy-in. Can you give people like, what are the kind of the three, did you have sort of a handful of of things that you did campaign for people who are listening and they're like, oh my God, I've got this problem too. What what advice do you give to them? Like, hey, here are the things that I did and that worked for me. Are there a few things on on either side of those lens that, that worked and didn't work that you would advise people to try if they need to kind of be in that same boat to get that buy-in and that excitement for the revenue cycle function within their organization? Sure. So first, I think, listen, right? And actively listen. When you're in meetings, if there's things that people are struggling with and you hear about it continually, then you constantly hear it. You got to be like, how can I help? Or let me see like what they're really talking about and let me put numbers to it or let me put in like dollars or operating expenses. So how do I take the clinical language translate that or mediate it within the financial language because now I have the clinical team to where they're like oh wait he's helping speak and communicate to finance we struggle with that like conversation and kind of mediating it so then once you have it from the clinical and the finance side that's where you bring it back together and then you start mediating and those wheels start turning of those conversations but what I would suggest is you know, really having a strategic way to prioritize things. Because once you're the, you know, popular department or area that are the smart area or smart guy, they're like, oh, wait a minute, I need Ken and I need Ken and his team to help with this, you know, and then that's where the team gets overwhelmed. How do you intake that information? How do you prioritize on the largest things that are clogging up providers' clinical time? Or how do you also address those things that are slowing down dollars for the organization? Some of the smaller things you may need to just say like, hey, this is a nice to have, or this also, we keep hearing about it, but we know that the fix for this is so substantial, or there's technology being developed, but that's where you keep it on that trending list. So As technology advances, as folks leverage their EMRs more, you're at conferences and talk to other folks, you're not creating the wheel from scratch. Like you're focusing your resources and those dollars of resources to really be the best outcome as possible. Because every revenue cycle shop and every healthcare organization, access is a number one issue to make sure that people are getting the healthcare that they need as fast as possible. So if anything can help with access, financial outcomes, and being able to reinvest in technology to help your patients, that's where you need to leverage those. So to me, I would say 
listen, gather information, having those conversations and really performing the analytics and keeping those eyes and ears open at conferences or even creating your ecosystem when you're at a conference. I encourage folks to meet and talk to two or three people that they have not met before and ask them like what their backgrounds is, where they come from, because some people may have worked their way all the way up with patient accounting to you know, revenue cycle or finance, and others may be IT. So for me, I have that hat because I was like, I worked on the IT side and programmed like early on in my career. So that allowed me then to put those three languages together, but come up with the defined prioritization process, I would say, of at least five or six metrics that fit revenue cycle for prioritization. Because otherwise, I think folks spend so much time reasoning or trying to come up with the solution that it's not outcome and is it measurable? Because if something's not measurable, then I think sometimes we can have a lot of political attention there. And if it needs to be, then that is something that has to be discussed with the senior executive leadership team. But then really you know, able to watch the needle move and then pulse when you make those changes to ensure true success and not just talk. Because sometimes it's such a pain point for one or two people. You may have five or six accounts or patient complaints that it's just folks know those people or their frequent flyers Mm -hmm. and they're chewing on that and not necessarily the true issue and priority at hand. So it's really like having something that's measurable is what I would suggest. Because if not, then I think that's where resources can be wasted early on. And we had to reset with like our department administrators and directors. So that way we were more visual of what the team was working on, what the outcomes were, what stages that those were in, because you have to have both visual and written communication, I think, to be effective. Yeah. And, you know, the project, you know, the prioritization and be able to communicate that out and sometimes it sounds like very simple project management, but actually it's actually like a people leadership thing almost because if you are just like make, it's like if you and your teams have no way of like being aligned and you're just like, here, we got to do this. We got to do this project. You know, you're going to burn your teams out really quickly. And so I'm curious for you, you know, as you sort of moved up, can you talk about some of the, the, the people leadership and management things that have become important to you, the, the higher you've gotten in the organizational ladder? I'm just kind of curious, you know, because I think also like sometimes you get to a certain place and so much of the job can be people management, right? It's like your performance is almost like the team's performance. Yeah. And and that's a hard transition for a lot of people to make to go from individual contributor to people managing. I'm curious, you know, what you have sort of learned, what's worked for you, what surprised you in sort of that transition as you sort of worked your way up. So I think the first rule that I always give when I mentor the next generation of leaders or folks when I speak to college graduates about revenue cycle and what it is, it's knowing yourself and knowing are you a true people person or not? Because I think sometimes people go within a leadership role because they're driven by, oh, I'm going to be a manager or director and it's financial. But is that really what motivates them? Or is it grooming people and teaching? And I think that when you have that dyad approach of you want to teach and you also want to advance knowledge or processes, that's what makes for a really servient leader because they love to teach people. They don't withhold information. They want to say, I did this and it failed but let's try this or this worked for me at other organizations. And that's where it's sharing information and almost acting as that internal consultant to the organization because that information else and make them go through that exercise that you know is already going to fail. That's just frustration. And as a leader, you're not speaking up for your team. And, you know, to me, I think, again, it's 
remembering where I came from. So, you know, like I talked about early on what I knew that I wanted to kind of like help within this space. To be honest, in, you know, high school and college, I was like, oh my God, I hate accounting. And I absolutely hate like, you know, logarithms and stuff like this. I want to be more in public relations and, you know, the financial and business management side. And I'm a people person. But today I use that every single day, right? So it's kind of like knowing your A personality and your B traits, like for what your like personality and management style like makeup is, because I'm very much a people person, very high energy. But then my like inner self really is that kind of like data geek and like nerd aspect that I really like data mining. And I like understanding and figuring out the complex things that other people struggle with. So, you know, it's really knowing your strengths, knowing your weaknesses, communicating that to your team, being vulnerable, but, you know, having and developing a core group of people that you can count on and then have that safe space. Many times within conversations, you know, of a larger team, as you said, I'm not going to be successful and meet the metrics that I need to for the organization unless my team is working like a well-refined clock and moving things forward. So when there are issues, Sometimes that's where you have to plan for the unaccounted for, and you have to address those as soon as it's happening. What I find is many people are like, just get it done, or let's not worry about that issue. And it continues to build, and then it takes five times as long to resolve that than it would to have a quick, crucial conversation when there may have been some conflict or some like information that was incomplete. And if you would have been astute and asked for that information from the start, it would have saved time. It would have saved resources. And your team then would have been like, not only is, you know, Ken or other leaders that have trained this way a leader, they're a servient leader because they're going to speak up for me when they know that this is not in the best interest. And honestly, they're going to speak of the risk, the facts, and the issues. And if we're still told we need to proceed and do that forward, at least we've put that on the table so folks can ask and like have to think about those. Because too many people, I think, turn an eye or are like, it can deal with itself. I think part of that may be the military aspect of me too. Like when conflict arises, it's how you actually like solve it, how you communicate it. And then once it's communicated, how you redirect people in order to keep them continuing. That way they're just not stagnant or at a standstill. I love that. And, and you actually, you know, what's funny is as we're having this conversation, you answered the question that I was about to ask you, which is impact and the sort of the military background has had on your leadership because you know, like in the military, it's very. Resumited, yes. There is like, a, it's like clear communication. Everyone needs to know what, you know, I think, what is it? And it's like one up, one above and one below or something. You need to know what is happening at all times, like one rank above you and one rank below you in order to do your job effectively. We can touch on that a little bit more. So I think it's rounding, right? So, I mean, like my father retired as far as submarine chief of the boat and, you know, had hundreds, if not thousands of people that he was responsible for before he retired with his 30 plus year military career. But I always saw my dad round, even with the uncommissioned officers and the officers, like the younger sailors, like I always saw him round and it's like, so how are things going? How is your day going? How are perceptions? Because sometimes Decisions are made at the top. Then when you look at the resistance, the executive leadership group has the most time to know about changes that need to be made and to drive the result. The staff or the entry level, like the front lines that are just out of college or just out of high school and working and registration, things like that in entry level positions, they have one fourth or two thirds, I'm sorry, less time to adapt to the change from when the decision is made. So it's really letting them know why decisions were made, letting them know how it's going to be measured, 
letting them know and getting them excited to be like, hey, if we do this, this is going to help you here. And this should also like help relieve some of the number of touches or frustrations or patients screaming at you because like now we have this accounted for. And so to me, that's something that always needs to be done and the servant leader, but remember where you came from. Too many people, I think, graduate with their college degree and their master's degree, and they're like, I learned this in college. This is exactly what needs to be done. That's a hypothetical situation. Your frontline staff really see the things that change day to day or those barriers. So it's really removing that. And how I do that is we really have a safe zone, like a supervision um, type of like meeting to where I remove the directors out of the circle and the managers, and it's myself, the supervisors, the team leads and the analysts. And I'm like, we just want to have like an open aired meeting. And I want to know like what has been escalated up that's not getting done or things that you've been told like, well, Ken and the leadership team made the decision. We just need to get it done because then it wasn't communicated with the context that it should have been. So that's where you really address that. And you address the state of the union, but then too, you see sometimes, and like I said, you hear me say throughout today, step back and listen. When I hear the staff saying that we were known a week ahead of a change, maybe when I communicated it to the leadership circle underneath me for a month and it hasn't made it out. That's where I've got better homework to do or to make sure that, you know, people get it out or help force the communication to happen because without doing so, it creates undue stress for the team. And that to me is really where sometimes you have to step back and listen for how things have been communicated down. And if there are some resistance or if there's barriers or information wasn't fully shared with, along every team, and when you have a team of 500 plus people and different, you know, leaders underneath you, if six or seven of the teams out of 10 got the information and the other three didn't, why? Right. And then that's kind of where you have to like remove that because it's a balancing act. But to me, it absolutely has to be done to me. I round every week and literally try to make sure that I'm in one area like every single day and. I call it coffee talk. I'm in the break room making a cup of coffee, a virtual town hall. I'm like, hey, I'm having lunch. If you want to join in, here's an open town hall or aired this week. And here's some times just ask. We have set up a process to where staff can confidentially email um, myself and some of the other folks that are a part of that. So we can see some of the things and suggestions that they may have to help with process improvement but also things that they're like, hey, this change was made and we really weren't sure of this. And it acts as a confidential email. We really don't even know like who it comes into because it goes within our process improvement mm -hmm. team. And then they'll follow up with each of the leaders that are like, this was suggested. Did you know this? And that to me has been very eye-opening. So again, step back and listen and review because perception's really everything in the business. It's how you are perceived and also like those results. You're not going to make everybody happy, but I always believe in the 80-20 rule. That's incredible. So much to unpack there. I love the sort of skip level. I love the coffee talk, the rounds. That's an incredible thing to do. I don't think a lot of people actually make enough effort to, to do that actually to be, once you get elevated, like to actually go out and still make the time to kind of build connections and trust with frontline employees, people who are two, three, four levels below you in the organization. That's a good takeaway for anybody who is listening to this show, certainly. For you, like, what is the hardest thing about working in Revenue Cycle? You've been in it for so long. You started, you know, young family business in some ways. And, you know, but I'm, I'm curious for you, you know, because it's interesting, right? You're young enough where you probably remember pay phones in the mall. It's like a little bit like me, right? It's like, I think we're of that generation where it's like, we remember kind of the before and after times of like, you know, having to listen to cassette tapes and bag phone and your parents, like, you know, Ford Expedition, when you thought like, oh, yeah. we've got the bag phone, right? So yes. Yeah. Um, 
and, and not everyone has that, right? Like sometimes it's like you, you come up where you're just not used to technology or you only know technology. But I'm curious for you, like, what are some of the hardest things about kind of working in revenue cycle, especially for someone like you who has been doing it for so long? So for me, I think the hardest thing right now is how fast information is coming. Because with the pandemic, I feel like so many things were put on pause or programs had to be because people knew that there were staff vacancies and harder to keep their staff and a lot of uncertainty where a lot of the federal and state and you know county programs put things on delay. Uh, so a lot of that, I feel like we almost have three or four years of changes kind of coming all together, like within once, and you don't have a lot of time to make those changes, right? Thinking on your feet and really building out compliance. The other area that I think I find extremely like challenging is denials, because not only is the information coming at you, but then with denials, you make those changes, you make the process changes, but then sometimes the insurance company's not ready to take it. They already give you the confirmation that they're ready to, and then you're denied and you're like, I just went through all of this change control, all of IT, and now I'm getting denied. So then you have the key executive leadership, like why is cash down? Like, why is this happening? And then you have to show them. So to me, getting everything that you can in writing, right? So I'm like, not only within revenue cycle, I always say like, if I wasn't in this business, I should have been a lawyer because it's all about as far as like black and white, calling things out and communication and following up. You can have a spoken conversation, but follow up in writing because people are going to love to say, I misspoke or I don't recall. And that's something that, you know, is very much a time waster. But I really think it's more the fast piece of change, technology, and then really with it too is where you have the different, you know, age groups that are still working or that are within the workforce. You have those that are like myself and yourself as far as too, James, like to where, you know, we had the bag phone with your parent growing up. I do remember like P phones, you thought the first like cordless like phone in your parents' house with the answer machine, like, you know, you were like, okay, this is pretty cool. So, and things like that in the first navigation system in a car, right? To where now most people won't buy a car unless it has the backup camera and the navigation system in it, or they come standard. So technology is ever evolving, keeping up with technology. And you can't say this is the way we used to do it because change is inevitable. But then with the newer workforce that's just out of college or those that are coming out of high school, with being so tech driven, you almost have to work on the communication and the effective like people skills, right? Because many times people in technology talk more aggressively or differently than they do in person to where I always say communication should be a reflective of how you talk and perceive and your communication should show that of how you are as a person, right? That way it kind of is the branding in yourself. This is Ken Hogue and Ken Hogue's team. And, you know, like you can talk to Ken. He's very technical and personable, but emails too. And email courtesy of, you know, kind of like having a little bit of fluff or kindness goes a long way during a difficult conversation to where I think it's really balancing technology to do the work, balancing the multiple generations that are in the workforce and having them collaborate and really like see the strengths of each other because everybody brings something to the table that someone else doesn't. And I can do it, but it's like they can do it in 15 or 20 minutes where it takes me an hour or an hour and 15 minutes because I'm very mechanical and read instructions and things. They don't even do it. It's just like, this is what we do and this is how it goes, right? So it's really making sure that you have people in the right areas and hiring folks for the right culture and making sure that they're going to fit for that team because it's so dynamic and the ecosystem is so delicate that if you bring in something that derails from all of the efforts, you're going to go five step or four or backwards, not even one. You're going to go five. And then the damage control sometimes, you know, puts you further behind. But when change is inevitable, 
that's when you really have to make sure you're balancing your people, your technology, keeping up with the change, and then also denials. And that's something that we have had to make a dynamic team to where insurance follow-up and other organizations have denials, insurance follow-up, professional billing and hospitals should all be the same, just one team. It can be for the initial denial, but we have created a complex team, a higher level of skill that is focusing on resolving the denials. And that's helped our organization go from an almost 2% net write-off to under three quarters of a percent within 18 months. And that's one of the first changes that I made. And then I knew that was political for me because I was like, we got to do this and we need to do it right. If we do, then this could help get me to be the chief revenue cycle officer because people have talked about this for years, but they haven't pulled the trigger. But when we did that, that's when the organization's like, wait a minute, denials is more complex. You can't just have, you know, someone hired from the outside and teach them in six months. We need some of our most dedicated resources and skill set that are those individual contributors. They don't want to manage people. They don't want to train, but they love resolving issues. And that's where we really have created that within our denials team here at UHS. And we've also done that within our self-pay concierge because we want them to be able to resolve it to think outside of the box and to look at those patterns and not just resolve the one or two denials that they're like working. I'm seeing all of these denials from this payer and they bring that information to the table. So they're not only an individual contributor, they're also synthesizing that data to make a change and giving those suggestions to where then they feel even more valued. And they're like, look, I just helped the executive team and Ken stop the denials. This is going to get communicated to the clinics, but they may not like having those crucial conversations, but they like resolving that change. And that's something that I think was the hardest change that we've had to make. But again, for the success of revenue cycle and in the chief revenue cycle officer position, that's something I couldn't be more proud of. Honestly, have people reach out to me often that are like, we've talked about this for five and six years. How did you generate the change? to an organization that was not very technological before COVID and remote workforce to where now, you know, all of our workforce is almost like hybrid, right? People choose to be in the office like every day, but you offer that environment. So if we can do it here within a people-centric organization that is not a metropolitan area, but we're still within two hours of New York City, so you have that little bit of metropolitan like mindset. That's where to me, if we can drive the change, I think anybody can, but it's lobbying for that change, being innovative, setting targets and doing it in stages because the people just are like, we want to do this and it's not a well executed plan. It's going to fail. Yeah. That's like so much to unpack. And that's so great. I think for you, probably getting some, a, a win of that magnitude gives you the, um, well, I'm, I'm totally drawing a blank on the word, but it's like the, um, it's like you get the leverage to do like other stuff with the, like when you deliver something of that magnitude, it gives you the ability to do other things and get buy-in, like people, you deliver those results. And I would imagine it makes it easier to get the buy-in for other things you want to do, other big initiatives. But Ken, I want to be respectful of, of your time. So I'm going to just shift gears real quick. I, I feel like I could talk to you for another three hours. We don't have that time. So we're going to switch gears real quick. We're going to do the lightning round. Are you ready? Okay. Yeah, All right. Sure. So four quick questions. First answer is the best answer. And I am not going to interject at all. I'm just going to let you quickly answer. And then after that, I'll turn it over to you. We'll close the show with letting you talk about what roles you're hiring for, what you're looking for, things of that nature. But let's get into it. So lightning round, question number one, what is the most important metric you're measuring that gives you the most anxiety? So mine is candidate for billing because it changes with the complexity of who's in your hospital and facility 
and your coding resources and knowing as patients have more sickness or acuity, this is something that is ever changing and probably directly tied to my blood pressure every day. What's the biggest goal you want your team to achieve in 2024? I want us to continue as far as to, so basically the goal I want to achieve is the acceptance and buy-in and promotion of revenue cycle further. I want folks to have the goal. This has been vetted by revenues. We've provided a feedback or vetted something, and that means something to where we've earned that trust. So to me, that's my biggest goal, to be that vetting trust partner to where the organization fully trusts with the decisions that are made. That's awesome. What's something you wish more people, either in the industry or not, would talk about more when it comes to revenue cycle? Think self-pay. Like, so when you talk about patient responsibility, you know, it's not just, oh, patients can't afford. It's also about the health inefficiencies or like barriers and how organizations are helping address those for the patients either by grant programs, concierge, other types of like, you know, offerings. Many people are like, that's the social determinants and, you know, hospitals try to help. That needs to be a priority though, because if people don't have somebody advocating for that, then they're not going to really have the great healthcare outcomes that they need because they don't understand. I love that. And four, what is your professional superpower? My professional superpower, I think, is my energy. So I'm typically high energy from the time I get out of bed till I go to bed. I can go off of five or six hours of sleep. But to me, it's, I think, the passion that I bring to this space. But my superpower really is like my energy as well as my people skills, because it's like I could have no sleep at all. And I think that's why I like going to New York City often when I work there. You can be sleep deprived, but you feed off of other people's energy when you're a true people person and that re-energizes you. I love it. All right. So finally, we're going to close the show. We're going to turn it over to you, let you talk about sort of working with the UHS revenue cycle teams. Are you hiring for roles? If people wanted to learn more, where can they go to see roles? Are there ones that you're looking to fill immediately? Talk to us about what your hiring situation is like right now. Sure. So it's much better than it was. Like we have a few openings. We really don't have a lot, but we also have started to have people, you know, reach out to myself or the organization from similar interactions as is today. We will be hiring a few revenue cycle analyst positions. There's a few coding positions that are open. And then probably there will be a director of operations also opening on the team soon. I would say, as with any organization that's larger, it changes every day. But if folks go to nyuhs.org, they can see the organizations if they want to follow me within LinkedIn or others. For those that are, you know, the higher level positions and others, I post frequently as well as with my leaders. If folks are looking for another career opportunity, or maybe looking to move or for a location that's in person in New York State. We have a number of opportunities like nursing and others within our organization. We're a very patient-centric organization, but also the culture here is important. And I have worked for other organizations where folks have just felt like a number. The organization here is very dedicated to people and it's the number one priority. Other organizations had mandatory layoffs and things within COVID. Our organization didn't, and we reinvested or had those people help in the areas that they could to avoid that. To me, that really speaks near and dear to the organization and being dedicated to its people. Uh, But stay tuned. There's many positions that would open and we continue to grow. So if folks are looking for that, and we also have hybrid and remote opportunities as well, workday system is folks would go on and look within Indeed and apply, they will uh, be able to filter if it's hybrid, remote, in-person, as well as the hiring like leader. And then if folks have questions, I would say you can always send a private message or chat through LinkedIn and happy to answer any questions. Yeah, that's awesome. So thank you. So I was going to say too, 
Ken's LinkedIn. Your content's fantastic. You're an absolute must follow. I have enjoyed being connected to you and seeing the stuff that you post about. There's always something so great. And so is LinkedIn, that would be the best place to kind of find you outside of here and follow up? It would be. I'm very active, as you said, like James, and then to like just send me a chat or if you see something in common on one of the positions that I post, please let me know or the nyuhs.org website and go to our career page. Our social recruiters and folks there within chat and like, you know, sending emails for potential positions that folks may be looking for is also an option as well. Awesome. And we'll drop a link to your profile in the comments below. Ken, thanks so much for your time. I've immensely appreciated your contributions and this has been such a great conversation. So thanks so much for joining the show. All right. Thanks for having me.